and the, um, and the air traffic control system. So this is a video of an Aurora airplane and it starts with the pilot getting out of the airplane. The flight is about to begin, that's the pilot. He just walked off the ramp. There's a crew chief here that commands engine start. This is all done, it's done right down the checklist. The airplane is a certified four place general aviation composite airplane. This one happens to be made in Austria. Um, and there's no occupants on board and this is in the national airspace system. It is not in any kind of special controlled airspace. This is at Griffiths Air Force Base. Back from there, the command is given to launch and that's it. And the people supervise, what, or people watch what happens, but the airplane is completely on its own. All functions of the takeoff, um, the flight path, now you can change the flight path with any update frequency, uh, high bandwidth uh, uh, controls to it. You can update the flight path, but basically the left seat is a uh, is there for a human pilot. The right seat is a there's a robot literally sitting in the right seat of the airplane, and the robot has the capability to do everything in the pilot operating handbook. So every emergency contingency that humans are briefed on the robot is prepared to handle. Now that's not to say every contingency, right? But every contingency that the pilot is trained in the operating handbook to handle, the Centaur can see more of these. Well, because of that thing I mentioned earlier, the one thing this can't do today is first of all, it can't tell that there's not a 747 on this runway that it's about to land on. It's gonna land there. Avoid non-cooperating traffic. If you have transponders, if you have uh, ADS-B, Sure, these things, uh, the deconflicting is, is relevant. That, now the other thing you, you need to do <laughs> once you've made the autonomy work is that you need to get rid of the runway or you'd like, you know, to go back to that vision of sort of where's my jetpack. So this is a, a project we're doing at Aurora called the VTOL X-Plane. This is a all electric subscale. This is about the size of what Z has been working on uh, and is quite similar. It's electric, it's battery powered. Uh, it's, this is an all electric airplane. This has 18 fans in the wing and, and uh, six in the canard. It's flying today and it has the limitations of any battery powered airplane, which is it only flies for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. And um, at first you go, that's crazy. By the way, the idea that it only flies for 20 minutes is one of the reasons Aurora and most other U.S. companies didn't develop the quad rotor, right? Is because we
one question. Do the raised hands by kind of reaction block the phone if you can? Mario will send you a message that asks you to unmute so you can voice your input. Once your question is answered, you will be put back on mute. Thank you for your cooperation. Christopher will now introduce our guest speaker. Can you move a little closer to the computer? So we can hear you. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Bostick. I'm a member of the Fire Nesby Junior Tech Entrepreneur Team. I'd like to share a little bit about our guest speaker for today, Dr. John S. Langford III. Dr. Langford is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. He received his bachelor's degree in aeronautics, master's in defense policy, master's in aeronautics and astronautics, and PhD in aeronautics and public policy, all from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. While at MIT, Dr. Langford organized and led a series of human-powered aircraft projects, accumulating in the Daedalus project, which in 1988 shattered the world distance and endurance record for a human powered flight. It was a 72 mile flight between Greek islands of Crete and Santorini. Prior to starting Aurora, he worked for Lockheed Corporation as an engineer on the development of the F 117 stealth fighter. As an intern at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and as a research staff member at the Institute for Defense Analysis. In April 2017, Dr. Langford was elected president of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. In 2018, he was elected a member of the National Academy of Engineering for the application of autonomy and robotics to design, development, production, and operation of advanced aircraft. Also, in 2018, he was named Aviation Week Philip J. Class Lifetime Achievement Laureate. With a long list of awards and recognitions, he also serves on board for MIT, University of Maryland, University of Mississippi, and several aerospace industry committees, councils, and boards. Dr. Langford is a lifelong air model and a passionate STEM at education advocate with memberships in National Associations of Rocket Street and Academy of Model Aeronautics. He has been a competitor or US team manager in 12 space model world championships and served in as the US modeling liaison to the Federation Aeronautica Internationale. In 2018, his family purchased Estes Industries the world's leading manufacturer of model rockets and model rocket engines. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, who is going to lead the discussion with us regarding insights and experience of being a tech entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Dr. John Langford. Thank you, thank you very much, Christopher. Um, it's really fun to, to be here. I, I'd like to kind of start by asking um, um, the kids uh, to come forward and, and join Christopher here in the sort of front rows, if that would be if that would be okay. I, my impression is we have mixed here a lot of a lot of uh, parents, I'm guessing, and uh, and uh, and students, and ask all the students to to kind of come up in the front row. Because I really do want this to be a, uh, a discussion. I, I have a bunch of stuff we could talk about, but what I really want to do is, you know, have it be a conversation, like Christopher said, um, and talk about stuff that you guys are interested in. So um, the first thing I want to do is just kind of go around the room and let you each introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit of your story and uh, you know, what, what kinds of things you're really uh, you're interested in in doing in the uh, you know in the future so you know why you're a part of the fire group and the and uh, you know what the kinds of stuff you're you're interested in so, so if you could start with your name and 
course, as you know, with the mask, you have to, you have to really shout. <laughs> There's lots of choices, and it's a, it's a, it's a great time. So let's see. Hi. Yeah. I'm Corey. I'm in fourth grade, and I don't want to do So Corey, you're you're in fourth grade, so I think you get the prize for being the the youngest. Is that right? Very good. I know you don't. <laughs> yeah, 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 I still think you're you're a student. So why don't you why don't you say hi? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kiri Houston. I'm a junior at Capital Technology University, majoring in astronautical engineering. Wow, I can't believe you're a junior already. It's just it's amazing. That's, that's so cool. Okay, did oh, we? I'm sorry, John. Do we have a couple of people online? Oh, sure. Thank uh, you. Not just from Thank Maryland, you. but actually from Kenya. Okay. Even so, better. Uh, they wanted to introduce themselves. Please. I don't know if you were going to type it in the chat, I can read it, or if you put your screen okay. on, we can look for you. Yeah. Kale, do you want to introduce your team, your kids? somebody showed up with just their phone number but those are just the three uh, here today and so they're part of the startup Africa um, Nesby chapter um, out of so they're part of the group in Mombasa and I've been teaching them about CubeSats for the past uh, several months and so yeah so maybe I know Sahil is typically the most outspoken one and also Mohammed and uh, Anuja can also say hello that'd be great and also tell us um either how old you are or what grade you're in, what, what school, school level. in aeronautics space really interests me and yeah I would like to uh, pursue something in the future with it hopefully it's a bit of a generic answer but <laughs> space is cool so yeah great okay Mohammed
fantastic. Welcome. And did we have one more? Fantastic. And I'm sorry, I did not catch your name. Could you say your name again? Yes, Adedua. Got it, Adedua. Thank you. Yes. Well, welcome. Good. Okay. Um, well, this is, this is great. Okay, so it sounds like people, we've got everybody from like fourth grade up to uh, uh, about 11th uh, grade. So, so that is a really, really good, uh, good, good time for thinking about kinds of stuff that, that you want to do. So, you know, my, my background is, basically has been a part of four big sort of themes in it that I wanted to just very, very quickly touch on and then kind of take it in any direction that, that, that you guys are interested. Um, so rockets have been a big part of my, um, of my life. <laughs> I got into, uh, into rockets in fifth grade so, uh, um, you know, uh, and, and have kind of been involved in it ever since. So sort of a, just about Corey's age is when I got started in this. The, uh, the kid in, who sat in front of me had a catalog from a company called Estes and uh, it looked kind of cool. And I, I liked building models and things like that. And so I got a starter set for my birthday and uh, it has taken me, um, that's really how I decided what I wanted to study in, in college was um, building rockets in elementary school and then through high school and using them in science projects and stuff like that. And then getting into a series of international competitions. And this is how I got to know Therese and, and Robin is that, um, you know, there is, People around the world fly these these uh, these models, and uh, there are competitions for uh, altitude and endurance. And what Carice, this is one of her models here, for uh, scale modeling, where you build an exact replica of a big rocket. Uh, this is a replica of a NASA sounding rocket that was launched down uh, at Wallops Island on the coast in, in Virginia. And you build an exact replica of it and it gets judged on accuracy and workmanship and then you have to fly it. And so you compete with people around the world and that, that was really transformational for me. I got into that when I was actually a senior in high school. And you get to meet, these were the days before the internet, before social media. So it's much harder to meet people who shared your interests than it is today. Today there's an online interest group for almost everything um, but when, uh, when I was growing up, that, that wasn't true. You actually had to, you know, meet people and that involved either corresponding in letters or going to places. And so the rocketry really opened worlds for me as it, as it can for you. That led me to, to, to a going to, uh, 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 and to study engineering in college. And in college, I got into these things called human powered airplanes, which is uh, started out again as a competition where uh, a British group, the Royal Aeronautical Society had offered a prize for the first team uh, that could build a plane that was powered just by a person. So you were not only the pilot, but you pedaled it as well. They had designed it and built it. They offered this prize, you know, 20 years before I got into it with, with my friends. And it turned out to be really hard to do. Uh, this, they, they originally offered the prize um, in, back in the 1950s. And again, people thought, oh, that'll be kind of simple. And it wasn't, it took, it took decades before anybody um, could, could, uh, could capture it. And I got into this with a student team at college where we started building airplanes uh, just to see if we could do it with the, with the idea of joining the contest eventually, but first learning how to do it. And this really um, totally convinced me 
that student projects are absolutely the best thing going. Because I, you know, it's one thing to sit in class and learn stuff from a book, but actually doing it with your hands and trying it out is really important. A guy at NASA said to me not too long ago, the most important thing you learn when you um, deal with hardware is reality. And, uh, and that's really true because it sounds easy on paper, but when you actually try to put it together, as you know from building the robots of Vex and stuff, right? That everything turns out to be, well not everything, but most things turn out to be challenging in ways you didn't quite expect because nothing kind of quite works perfectly. So we did a bunch of these human powered airplanes uh, we ended up doing five in all, and, and we flew uh, one in uh, between the Greek islands of Crete and Santorini in kind of a recreation of one of the, the great uh, Greek myths, the story of Daedalus and Icarus. Uh, and so we built and flew that airplane, and then I, that team that had gotten together, um, we formed a company. And with that company, we built uh, UAVs, unmanned aircraft, robotic airplanes, drones, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's what we, we did. And I spent the last 30 years uh, working on, on that company. We uh, started it from scratch and built it to about 1,000 a, a thousand people. Um, it, called, it was called Aurora Flight Sciences. And then uh, Boeing bought it a couple of years ago, and so it, it still um, it still exists out in uh, in Manassas. But one of the really big things you learn in all of this is engineering is a is a team activity, right? I mean, normally when you're working on your homework, it's sort of you doing your homework, right? And you think, well, the only the only team activities are sports, right? Out on the on the athletic field. And it turns out that that's not really right because in real life, all of these big complicated things are team activities. These are these are models of rockets that you know NASA has built, or that the guy who runs um, Amazon has built. But they're all built by teams, teams of dozens of people, hundreds, thousands of people work on some of these these big projects. And one of the great things that I learned. Uh, in doing stuff like the rocket teams and the human powered airplane teams was that engineering is in fact a team sport and that's that made it a lot more uh, a lot more fun actually than, than just an activity that you did by yourself so we did the uavs for for uh 30 years and then uh boeing bought that company so i i last year started a new company that is working to develop electric airplanes. And um, uh, the idea, uh, it's sort of like electric cars, right? That, that everybody gets the idea that, that burning fossil fuels releases a lot of carbon dioxide, CO2, into the air. And we're gradually warming the planet. And you can see that every day with all the fires and floods and all the weird stuff that's going on, um, which unfortunately is, you know, just a harbinger of things to come. Um, if we keep dumping so much CO2 into the into the planet and warming it, um, there, there's gonna, there's a lot of challenges there. And so one of the big things is how we change our lifestyles to emit less carbon, and in fact how we go back and recapture some of the carbon dioxide that we've already put out of there. Terrific future. All of you guys will be involved in that. Some of you directly inventing stuff, and some of you just living as citizens in a world where we can no longer just take it for granted that we put a straw in the ground and take oil out and can burn it with, with impunity. Um, Turns out oil is really a good fuel. I mean, oil-based, the hydrocarbon fuels are really, really, really hard to beat. Um, and so people are trying to do things like electric cars and all of that. And we're working on electric airplanes, but it's hard. It's, it's hard, it's challenging, and, and there's a lot of work to be, to be done. So, you know, between those fields of the space exploration where, I, you know, I mentioned that 
Right now there's four private citizens that got launched last week on a rocket, on a SpaceX rocket. That is really, I mean, I, I, to you guys it probably seems like, yeah, okay, of course. But um, to, to people like, like me and Robin, that's mind boggling because we grew up in a time when only NASA could build and launch a rocket, right? And only people who went into space were uh, NASA selected astronauts. And originally they were all, you know, uh, test pilots. And uh, it's only recently that they've expanded that um, to include scientists and, and, and you know, te some teachers and stuff. But now with the, the new wave of space that's enabled by private industry, uh, the people up there today, there's the International Space Station, which has the official astronauts on it, and there's this, uh, what is it, Inspiration 4? I forget what the name of it, it's something 4. Uh, and, uh, and those are very uh, ordinary people. They're not professional astronauts, and so they're up there right now. So it's an amazing time between that revolution in space, the challenges that are, that are being driven in how we take carbon out of ground transportation and air transportation and everything else in our life, there's a lot of big problems and a lot of exciting opportunities for each of you. So that was kind of the introduction. And I really wanted to, I, we could take this in a lot of different ways. I have a bunch of <laughs> slides and talks on every, each of those parts. But I don't, you know, you guys go to go to lectures in school all week, and I didn't want to come here and just stand up and give you another another talk. I really want it to be kind of um, a, a conversation. So I told you some stuff. I'd like to, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, questions, comments, things you'd like us, you'd like to talk about, um, based on some of the topics that I've kind of kicked out there. Um, and we could talk about, you know, running your own company, or any of those things, or um, kind of put it put it open. But what what is on your mind? What is, what what are you guys interested in in uh, in talking about here? Yes, sir. What were some challenges when we that you had, like forming the few separate businesses? Yeah, that's that's a great question. What were the challenges? in starting um, the businesses. Um, the, the big one is always money, um, you know, in, in these, because um, most businesses take some money, some capital to get it started, whether it's a, you know, franchise uh, operation, um, you know, in a, in, in, a, in a restaurant business to starting a technology business. Um, there's some capital required. And so that's always a big, a big challenge. And the bigger the projects get, the more money they take and the harder um, that is. It, it really never gets, gets easier. Um, beyond that, uh, so that's, that's the big one. Um, and so you have to put together uh, something that you really care about, that you're very passionate about. I mean, I used the word passion very deliberately there because any of these things you have to really want to do it and that's the number one piece of, of advice I would give all of you as, as you look at what you want to do with your life is find something that you care about right that you that, that, that attracts you emotionally and then figure out how to how to get paid to do it find something you love to do figure out how to get paid for it uh, is, is one of the big guidelines of, of, of I think, being happy in, 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 your, in your life. Sometimes that's easier said than done, but, um, but it's, it's worth staying with. So find something you really care about. Look at how, um, how you want to do it. That I was on the rocket field this morning, and, and I was talking with a young man who um, who Robin and Fries probably know, he, he's the guy who actually runs the Team America Rocketry Challenge at the Aerospace Industries Association. So he's an employee of theirs, and he has been the guy who, if you've been in TARC, you've probably interacted with him. 
and he uh, he's leaving. Uh, he, he came out and flew a rocket today, which was great, but he's leaving on Monday, which is too bad. And I was asking him, so where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And, and I thought he would say, I got another job, a better job, or I'm going back to school or whatever. You know, he's probably in his late 20s. He said, well, I've always wanted to have a bakery. And so I'm going to go give it a, a, a shot starting a bakery. And I said, that's fantastic. That's really cool. Because almost everything that, that you do, you look behind these successful businesses, and if you're willing to do something better than anybody else has does, or you know, with more care, with more attention, something something special about it, um, you can make a very successful business. And I have no doubt that he will be able to, over time, you know, uh, build a really nice uh, bakery business because that's what he cares about. And and so. I, I think finding finding that right, and like I say, there's a lot of a lot of topics uh, in the, in the world today in engineering. You guys are coming of age at a really exciting time, right? I mean, it, if you watch the news, you kind of go, "Oh my gosh, this is the whole world is falling apart. This is terrible." But the next level down, I mean, that is true. There are lots of of real challenges in the world. But that just means there are opportunities for each one of you to make a huge difference, right? To, to do something, to think of something, to discover something, to invent something, to be part of a team that does something that helps solve some of these amazing challenges that, that we have coming at us in, in every direction, as a society and as a world, right? So um, it really is like, Think of what, think of what you really care about. And and let me just say the other thing is, the the cool part of education to me, the real part of education is to help you find what you do care about, right? Because when you're when you're in fourth grade, you know it's hard to know what the world is like, right? It's a big world out there, and it's really hard to know what really turns you on and what you're really excited about. And so a big part of the role of education is to help you discover things that you're interested in. I know a lot of times it doesn't seem that way because the curriculum in the school, because you know, it's, it's pretty structured. There's 50 million kids in this country between kindergarten and 12th grade. 50 million kids. So while everybody in the education business knows the best way is one-on-one -on -one experience-based learning really hard to do that with 50 million kids, right? And, and that means every year there's like 4 million new kids coming into the system and 4 million kids moving out of the system. And so it's hard to provide the kind of really customized instruction that everybody would like. That's why what you're doing with FIRE, what, the, what, what NSD's doing, is so cool, right? Because that's, that's the part of the education system where you really can dig into some piece um, of, of something that you're interested in uh, and not just be driven by, you know, standardized test scores where, the, where, you know, which are a good thing. I'm not knocking that. It's just that, you know, a lot of the, the mainstream curriculum has to be built around, you know, sort of the common curriculum core that, that the system has decided everybody should have some exposure to. So a big part of it is figuring out what you're interested in. Um, because, you know, you don't really know, most people don't really know when they're your age exactly what it is that they really care passionately about, right? It's easy for me to stand up there and say, find something you really are passionate about and then follow it. Part of the education is finding that thing that you care about. And part of that is trying a bunch of different stuff, which is exactly the kinds of stuff you guys are doing with these sorts of things, is trying, trying some different things. Great. Um, do you have any any thoughts on like what a cool business to to do would be? No, you great. Currently, I'm thinking about uh, I'm doing a project with um, this company trying to grow food in their environment uh -huh. and like the buy and stuff. Yeah. So right now we're doing vertical farming, pretty much a greenhouse. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when I was like doing this project with them, um, I have a, I, I knew I wanted to start something. So um, I'm pretty sure they're using it like as a prototype. 
type uh, like go through his space and stuff. Yeah. Like by 2027, and see the world's first space hotel. That would be very so cool. I guess for like a career, think about maybe like starting my own company. Uh -huh. like that. that 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 kind of thing I think would have all kinds of benefits, not just on the moon. I mean, if you can do it on the moon, there's you can do it in in around places on Earth, Mars, exactly terraforming. Um, you know, how we do exactly what you were talking about. I mean, like, you know, when the settlers moved west in this country, they didn't take all of their food and all of their oxygen and all of their water with them the way we do. When we went to the moon, the astronauts took everything, right? Everything they needed, they took with them, which is why they only could stay for a few days. Same when people went to Antarctica for the first time. But eventually, you got to learn how to live in the place where you're going. And so exactly what you're, you're talking about, figuring out how to live off the land, whether it's the changing land here in, in the world, this planet, where the climate is changing. And, and particularly for you know, the, the students uh, over, over there in Kenya, I'm sure they see it just as we see it here in the American West. Um, tough on agriculture and stuff these days. And so that, there was a really cool, really cool thing. And by the way, and that's of course, as I'm sure you know, that's really hard to do, right? It's, there was a, a, a structure, a project out in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, called the Biosphere 2. You might run into it at some point. And it's where a team did exactly what you said. They built this big, giant greenhouse, basically, trying to make it big enough that they could really circulate everything and have water cycles and carbon cycles and grow plants in, inside this in a different environment. And then they put people in it. And it's fascinating to go read about what happened when they did that. I mean, it, it didn't work that well. <laughs> it's really hard to do, but that's, you know, you, you can go build what you're interested in on what other people have tried and figure out how to do it better. That's, that's really, really, really cool. Okay, sorry, Jeff. Uh, sure. Again, for the people online, you can type your questions in the chat or use the raised hand icon if you want to voice your own question and the moderator will invite you to unmute. Other things that people are interested in? Yes, ma'am. How would you start the day? So literally in the den of my house, um, uh, uh, the, where, you know, the, the biggest, one of the big challenges is getting to the point where you can quit your, your day job and pursue what you're interested in. And you have to be very careful with about that, right? Because you don't want to quit too soon um, because you do need to have some means of support and you don't want to way too late because you really, you know, once you're committed, that, that's when stuff really happens, right? When, you, when you've when made that commitment, that you're all in, um, that's both when you give it that extra effort because you have to, and it's also when just all kinds of stuff happens that you didn't really expect to happen, right? Once you're committed, then other people become more committed to help you. It's hard to explain, but, um, but, it, but, it, but it's real. And, and uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good lead in for, for this, this chart, which is something that I, I show uh, all of our employees and stuff. Um, it's, it's kind of a car cartoon, but it's really true. It's, it's just, it's you know, the emotional journey of creating anything great. And you start off, right, with all of these things, you start off, this is a great idea. This is the best thing I've ever done. This is gonna be really, really awful. I mean, really, really great, sorry. And then you, and then you kind of invariably go through this journey and, and you go, this is gonna be fun. And then you get into it and you go, hmm, this is harder than I thought. And then you realize this is gonna be a lot of work. And then you start to, and then the way it was drawn here, I didn't, I didn't draw this this chart, but I can totally relate to it. The swamp of despair, which pretty much every idea goes through multiple times, um, where it seems like this is not such a good idea, it's a disaster. 
and then eventually uh, most ideas, successful ideas, sort of come out that other side, right? Where you go, oh, this is really awful. And then you start to come out and say, well, okay, this, this is still kind of bad. And maybe we should just declare victory and stop. And then you start to go, mm, wow. And eventually it becomes one of the things that you're most proud of. In, in, the, in, the, uh, in our company, we always talk about the life cycle of an idea that would go from a sketch on a napkin to a photograph on the wall of the finished airplane. And that was sort of the life. And the idea of, you know, if you stayed at it long enough in the, in the business was, you'd have a bunch of those things that you were really proud of that you, you know, can look back on later and go, I'm really proud of, of, of doing that and being a part of that. And, and one of the, the things that's interesting to this about this to me is this idea that there's a bridge, right? That you, to get through these inevitable um, swamps, it's belief, it's persistence, it's your family, it's a sense of humor, all of those things that it's that support structure that you build around you or that gets built around you that allows you to get through that. Uh, somebody, one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard on, before we went on these first international rocket trips was on this trip, think of yourself like you're on the set of a situation comedy. Because if you kind of take that mindset, okay, if I'm, I'm on the set of a situation comedy, then all of the things that go wrong don't seem quite so frustrating uh, when you kind of look at it that way. But it's, it's this stuff that backstops you, your family, the other parts of your life that backstop you um, and allow you to get through these, these parts. So that, um, you know, in every one of these ventures, you start, you start out there, this is a great idea, and hopefully you make it through the setbacks and you come out to the other side. Every project I've been involved in goes through that. I'm sure on the robot that you guys did, there's times when you go, this is not going to work. Why, are, why am I wasting my time doing this? And then you eventually, hopefully, you get to the point where you go, that was awesome. That was the coolest thing I ever did. Other questions, comments, ideas? That's a great thing. Um, well, let me let me answer that question a little differently um, because uh, uh, let me let me just speak to the question of, of values, right? Which I think is something that you you start with, but you also build with as you go. And I wanted to ju I'll, I'll just share with with the with the students here some of the values that I've tried to push on our team. And, and I always, I've, I've never really been a big fan of mission statements and stuff like that that people put up. They tend to be very, very generic, sort of what we call motherhood things. And so I've tried to focus on things that are a little different shape. I mean, obviously you want to be law-abiding, good, moral citizens, um, but um, the organizations that I've uh, put together, we've kind of focused on a set of things. And the first is safety, right? That, that um, it, it's been said, safety is the only sustainable business model, right? And, and in the technology, that's true in everything, it's really true in the technology area. So safety for you, safety for your team, safety for the consumers and the public. Um, the second thing that we really push on is something that and, and we've had this for 25 years, so I did not make any of this up just for the current political climate, but the in integrity of data 
Integrity of data is really essential. In running your business, in running your life, you will be making decisions on numbers. One, one of the things about when you have to take all these classes, it turns out a lot of stuff in these classes is actually important to something you're gonna do in the future. And my complaint is they often don't tell you why you're learning this, right? Why am I learning this differential equation or why am I learning this method or whatever? And, and it turns out that there's usually a good reason for that. They just don't always, always tell you that. But on all of these information, data is just information. It's, it's often numbers, but it's also words and concepts. Um, you're going to make decisions based on data and understanding. And so you need to have the best possible attention to that data, the integrity of that data as possible. No, I mean, if you have perfect information, it's usually easy to make decisions, right? But you never have that, right? In life, in, in your business, uh, in politics, it's very unusual to have perfect information. Usually you're trying to make a decision with imperfect information. So I encourage everybody in our team, in our organizations, to consciously protect and improve the data. Uh, my, my, my dad always said, leave the campsite better than you found it. And what I, uh, my translation of that here is, improve the data when it passes through your hands. So that when you're done with something, whether it's a telephone list or a recipe or a computer calculation, that it is more accurate, um, more complete than when you got it. So that idea that data is fragile and it's part of your job to protect it and to improve it. <clears throat> um, a sense of urgency, but maintain a sense of urgency and a bias towards action. We always talk about this, that as a small business, you're gonna be competing against people who are bigger than you and better funded than you and probably more experienced than you. So how do you, how does that work? How do you compete against somebody who has all the advantages? Well, the way you do it is that you care more than they do, right? And that you, you have a sense of urgency that this has to get done today. It was like, like we were talking about a little before, like, you don't want to quit your job too soon, but you don't want to wait too long. When your back is against the wall, when when you know you and your team don't eat, if you don't get this product shipped or this sale made or this report completed, you it focuses your mind and you and you really work on it. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big believer in small business is but but whatever you're doing in this, the sense of urgency, the bias towards action. You'll have a lot of things that you could either finish it today, or you could wait till tomorrow. And in big organizations, the sun is gonna come up tomorrow, whether you finish that thing today or not. But in a little operation, if you finish it today, then you could be doing something else tomorrow. And so that sense of urgency, that bias towards action is critical. Now, sometimes you won't always be right, right? I mean, I, and I tell, our team members, look, a bias towards action, sometimes you will move too quickly, right? You'll move too fast. Uh, I'm not saying be reckless, but don't be afraid to make a decision. And, you know, sometimes you'll have to backtrack. Sometimes you'll be wrong. But in the long run, um, that's your only competitive advantage against bigger, better funded, more experienced competitors. Um, you know, focus on I said, sometimes you'll be wrong. And when you're wrong, focus on fixing the problem, not the blame. That's the other thing, is right. It's really easy, and in our society today, um, particularly in, um, in a lot of media stuff, is like, who, whose fault is this? Well, really in the organization, what you care about is not whose fault it is, but how do you fix it? Um, fix the problem. Doesn't mean you don't want to do lessons learned. You always want to do sort of a, a lessons learned thing. But the goal of that is to learn from what happened and not assign, not, not to assign uh, blame or point, point fingers on that. Um, the next thing is that 
you've got to recognize that good ideas come from anybody in the organization. It's very easy in an organization to go, oh, the boss knows more or gets to make the decisions or all the ideas come from the top. That is not, in my view, the characteristic of a healthy, good organization, right? Good ideas often come from the people who are looking at it for the first time with a new set of eyes. You guys are a different generation than, than me and Robin and a lot of the, of the adults in the room. And you have grown up at a different time and you look at things differently. And sometimes that really makes a very big positive difference. That, that's, the, that's the diversity argument, right? That's the real substance in why you want people with different backgrounds and different ways of looking at problems on your team because the wrong way to do it is to, is to have a hierarchical view of, uh, of, of what the right answer is. And the right way to do it is to try to draw from the broadest possible team with ideas because you're driving towards, you know, great, great ideas and great answers. Um, personal accountability, that's another big thing that's really hard to do. What does that mean? Um, to me, it, it means, uh, the, one simple way to think about personal accountability is make people sign their work, right? When you do something, I'm a big believer that you should have to put, you should put your name on it. You should be proud of putting your name on it. Um, it's like on drawings, right? You sign a drawing. Um, again, and I've said, oh, it's a team sport, and, and it is a team sport, but people have individual contributions, and one of the ways that you make people own something is not you get mad at them if it goes wrong, it's by making them, to me, um, sign, put their name on it, associate it with sign your work. Um, because when you put your name on it, you're putting your reputation, your brand. Um, and you always put a little bit more on it when you know that, you know, somebody's gonna, gonna, gonna look at this and, you know, say, oh, Camille did this. And uh, uh, I, I think that's just a little thing that, that applied over a big, a big thing is part of what makes successful teams be, be successful. Um, treat other people with dignity and respect, right? That is one of those things that seems really obvious, but it's really not, <laughs> it's, it's not as common as you would think it is. And it is something that, uh, that you need to consciously focus on because it's really easy when you're doing all this other stuff, moving fast, um, and, and sometimes moving fast means making mistakes. Sometimes you go move fast and break things. I'm not a fan of that, but, but um, uh, that, that focus on making sure that you treat people with dignity and respect, um, partly because it's the right thing to do, but also because this is a really long-term thing, right? It, and and if, uh, if no one wants to work with you, you're gonna not get that far. Um, it, it's really important to, to, to have that element of, of um, I mean, sometimes it's called likability, but I don't really, that's not, that's not really completely the right word. But it's, it's that dignity, it's the element of dignity and respect that is, um, I think is really is fundamental. And then finally, the last one is leading by example, right? Which especially in your own business. It's true in your life, but especially in your own business, if you're running the business, people are gonna look to you for the standard, right? The biggest determinant of what the culture is in an organization that you've started or that you run um, is you, and they're gonna watch what you do, and you need to you know, be aware of that. Keep that in your mind of sort of everything that you that you do. So I know that's not exactly the answer to the question that was was asked of what is your day like, but if you put all these things together, it sort of forms the um, the basis for um, 
for, for the day. <laughs> I'll, uh, other other questions? Comments and directions or stuff that you'd rather talk about it. Well, we're just about out of time. I, I, I could talk about rockets or electric airplanes or whatever as much as you want, but I thought I would. Is that that a talk for, that yes, was, yes, sir. Sure. So, so you started these businesses. Yes. And it seems like you sold some of the businesses. Yeah. Right? Yes. But these are your babies. You grew it from yes. one person to a thousand people. Yes. How did that feel? I mean, how, how did you yeah. t allow, uh, you know, how did you get to the place where you said, I can, I can let this go? Yeah. That is a really good, good, really good question. It is a lot like having, uh, raising children is, <laughs> is my view. And that, that. You know, on the one hand, raising kids, you know, your, your goal is to make them independent, right? So that they can be functioning, productive, happy citizens that don't just rely on you. But at the same time, they're your kids and you, you want them, you want them there all the time and you want them to remember, you know, that you want to still be the most important thing in their life the way you were when they were one and two. And, and it's a lot like that in the business, is that getting to the point where you can, uh, um, you can let go is important. Now, now and you know, I mentioned that we sold the businesses. The acquirers often help you with that process. <laughs> they're often, they're like, okay, in a big company, nobody had had the same job for 30 years, right? Big organizations rotate, intentionally rotate people more than than little companies, which is one of the ways the little companies can compete, right? Because we would often go into meetings with organizations many, many times bigger than us. And we had a team that had been doing this for 10 or 15 years by the time we got good at it. And people on the other side of the table were new this week. I mean, now they knew a lot, they rotated around, but, um, but that longevity is, is an, an important piece. But the big companies rotate and when you, um, when they buy a company, things do change now as part of their organization. And they're like, okay, yeah, it's great that you ran it for 30 years and it's your baby. But now this week, we, now we want you to go do something else. And, uh, and, and so they help you with that, yeah. with, that, uh, with, that, with that process. It's one of the things you always think you're ready until it really happens and then you go, not really ready for this. This, this, is, this is really painful because of all the things we just said that you're totally emotionally invested in this stuff and and that's the good part but then the other side is you're totally emotionally invested in it so you take it's easy to take everything personally even when you go over and over and you say oh don't take this personally this, it's really hard to not take things personally and uh and that is um Part of that growth process it's there's a letting go process there's you know a, a lot of elements in that and and um, sometimes that can be be really painful or really difficult um i have another question um what's something that you wish you could have changed like knowing all the stuff that you know now yeah the, that's a that's a really good question um there are plenty of things that I would probably do over and do differently uh, if, if I had the one of the, one of the big ones was in the uh, early stages of Aurora. We were doing an airplane that was a really high altitude, short duration airplane for scientists who were trying to study ozone in the stratosphere, and we were building a very specialized research airplane for them. And um, you know the business school part. Of, of us, you're always looking at how big is the market? And the answer is the market for that airplane was tiny. And so we said, oh, what we need to do is while we're doing this, we also need to do another airplane that would have more customers, right? That would be lower altitude, longer endurance. And we started doing that and the mis it sounded like a really good idea and it was a really terrible idea because we were too small to do that. And by splitting our attention, we failed at both of the projects, right? And if I had that to do over, I would have stayed concentrated on the first one. Even though the market 
ultimately we were right, the market wasn't that big, the element of success, people look at what you're doing and it's more important to be successful at whatever it is you take on, in my opinion, than it is to, you know, have a giant market value in the weekend. Um, because people, people are always worried about how much it costs, it costs schedule and budget. But at the end of the day, what they really remember is that it worked. <laughs> that nobody actually remember. In the long term, people almost never remember how late you were, how over budget you were. The first question they want to know is that it worked. What are some other ideas that, and Robin, you just stop us when, because I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, what are some other ideas that, that you guys have, are thinking about that, that, you're, that you're interested in or that you know, talking about this has made you think about? Yeah, the question is, did I have any friends who were interested in doing this? And the answer is yes. But that turns out to be a very, you know, I think where you're getting at that is a, is a really interesting question, which is, should you be in business with your friends? <laughs> or, or friends and your, uh, even more your family, right? And, and that's a harder question, right? I, the answer is, you know, I, when I started the business, the first people I drew in were the people who had worked with me on the last one. I remember we were talking about the human powered airplanes that sort of led to the unmanned airplane stuff. And, uh, and so when we started this, uh, the first people were people who had been drawn to this. And so we had become, you know, really good friends. But the friendships had come out of that association. The danger in starting something with your friends is that, you know, it can get pretty rough as we've talked about in there. And, and um, not every friendship survives in that environment of uh, a small biz a business relationship where your back is against the wall a lot and you are really having to make sometimes painful decisions. So I think it's a mixed message, right? It's a, it, there's no perfect answer. On the one hand, one of the great parts of having your own business is there's, <laughs> you should be able to like everybody in the business. You're hiring every, if you're hiring everyone, you know, you should be very careful about the, the interview. We spend a lot of time interviewing people and, and, uh, and, and making sure that the team To, to the best um, that we could, um, that we, we we've been very deliberate about who we hired, and and again that goes back to the diversity thing because it's those those kind of tend to be at odds a little with each other, right? Because the people you're most comfortable with are the people most like you, and that is not a recipe for building a diverse team. So how you reach outside that comfort zone and how you build a system that, that does it and, um, and does it effectively, right? That still, you know, that builds a, builds a strong team. There's no magic recipe for that. You know, that's not something you can just write in a procedure. There are some best practices. There's some things that, that work really well. But there are, in all of these things, there are sort of tensions in that. So you want to like the people, you certainly can hire friends and family. Sometimes that works great because you really know them, like them, and liking the team you're working with is important for the kind of effort you're gonna to have to put in. But, um, but it, it, it's not without risks and downsides. We do want to try to respect everybody's time because we did sure. get two and then there are yeah, people yeah. online. Yep, but sure. we did want to save some time for pictures and networking and some other stuff once we turn the cameras off. 
So Mel, would it be okay? Just want to say thank you again to Dr. Lampor for coming out and spending his um, sharing his expertise and his Saturday afternoon with us. I'm um, pretty sure we're learning something new from what he's told us about and what um, his passion project or his passion was about. And um, with this, I think I believe all of our imaginations have taken flight or taken a new trajectory into limitless, limitless possibilities are, of our future. I um, just want to say thank you again for coming out. Um, I'm Elvin Smith. I'm a part of the Fire Rocket Challenge team. And uh, that concludes the event for today. Uh, stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you next time or next week, next Saturday. Okay. And if I could just close with one last, last thought on that, which is to thank all of uh, the adults in, in the room. The, um, I'm guessing most of you are parents, but, but maybe not all. And, um, you know, it, it is, uh, I, I'm sure that when, that your parents say a lot of the same stuff that I'm saying, but sometimes hearing it from somebody who's not your parent is more impactful, it's a different, different voice, but it really is important in all of this to have that support structure, right? When you're, when you're two years old, it's really obvious what support structure means. It's a little harder to figure that out by the time you're in 10th grade. But um, all of the adults, the adults around you are, are part of your team, right? Are part of your support structure. And you should look at them that way. Um, I know that's a little bit, of maybe of a different way to, to look at them, but, um, and there are plenty of folks who um, go off into, into new directions that uh, their parents either don't know anything about or aren't interested in. Um, but there are also plenty of, of, uh, of, of um, parents who develop new interests based on, on uh, what you're interested in. And so it's, uh, so thank you to all of the parents in, 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 in this because it takes their support to make stuff like fire happen. Um, as well as, you know, there's a, the teachers. There are some really, really amazing teachers. It's like everything else, you know, there's the, some people it's a job, but there's some real superstars and boy, you can really change lives in that. Um, in that. I'm sure you all know teachers who are, who you idolize and uh, uh, they are, just so important in this. We gotta raise, you know, it's four million new students every year in this country. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, the future depends literally on you guys and how well we adults do in helping you get get ready, get fired up, get ready to go. So thanks. <laughs>